Well, hey there. I'm Joshua Johnson. It's great to be with you on this Tuesday, April 12th. And tonight, New Yorkers are talking about a scary day on the subway. Police are searching for whoever attacked the train through Brooklyn this morning. We'll have the latest on the manhunt, the victims, and the investigation. For the first time, President Biden is calling the invasion of Ukraine a genocide. Meanwhile, Vladimir Putin says Russia is preparing for a new phase of the war. We are live in Lviv with more, and you'll hear from an expert on international criminal law. Authorities are beginning a wide-ranging investigation into alleged war crimes. Plus, inflation just hit a 40-year high. Prices are getting higher from groceries to gas. Why is this happening? And how are people supposed to make ends meet? Let's begin here in New York after a rather tense day where a manhunt is underway. Tonight, the NYPD identified a person of interest in the shooting we've been telling you about. This is him, Frank James. To be clear, he's being referred to now as a suspect, as not being referred to as a suspect, just a person of interest. He's someone the NYPD says is connected to the subway shooting in Brooklyn. But again, he is not being characterized right now as a suspect. It happened in the middle of the morning rush hour. The suspect appeared to set off smoke grenades inside a moving subway car, then shot at least 10 people. More than 20 were hurt. Here's what one survivor told our affiliate WNBC. I just saw there was three people that were injured. Injured. I was coming out the train and I saw a lot of smoke and I smelled it. It was a really strong smell. Um, it was nothing like fire. It was a lot different than what the smell of fire is. And... Um, I saw maybe a 16-year-old kid, he was sitting on the steps on coming out the train station and he had a bullet in his knee. And what'd you, what'd you make of that? What were you thinking? Uh, um, I, I, uh, well, I was speechless as I am now. Um, it's a very scary sight to see. Uh, he looked very scared and as I stood out the train station, two more injured victims came out the train station, wounded on their knees and on their uh, thighs. Now, the suspect appeared to leave a bag behind. From that bag, police recovered smoke canisters, fireworks, what could be gasoline, and a gun. There was also a key to a U-Haul van. And this evening, the NYPD announced that it found the van. New York Mayor Eric Adams did not speculate on what could have motivated this attack. It's just too early to say. But police say it does not appear to be an act of terrorism. Mayor Adams, by the way, is isolating at home after testing positive for COVID. Meanwhile, life goes on in New York. Tonight, the Brooklyn Nets are playing the Cleveland Cavaliers in hopes of sealing a playoff spot. The game is taking place at the Barclays Center, which, as you can see on this map, is about two and a half miles from the crime scene. And for those of you who are not familiar with New York, nowhere near some of the big landmarks in Manhattan you might be familiar with. But the Nets did advise their fans to expect extra security. The shooting happened in a neighborhood called Sunset Park. This subway station is a big commuting hub. Express trains go through it, so it's a quick way to get into Manhattan. Sunset Park is a diverse area, lots of working class residents. There's a big shopping center that's a short walk away, and it is near the Greenwood Cemetery, the final resting place of notables, including conductor Leonard Bernstein and artist Jean-Michel Basquiat. NBC's Ron Allen starts us off tonight from Brooklyn with more on the investigation. Ron, what do we know about the manhunt so far? Well, it's intense, and frankly, the way things have been moving today so rapidly, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we find out in the coming hours that this individual is in custody. Um, things have moved very quickly. There's been a massive, massive manhunt. Uh, because of the horror of what happened on the subway, and also because of the times that we're in, the, as you know, there's been a lot of violent crime in the city lately that's been grabbing the headlines. Uh, and at a time when the city is trying to take steps towards recovering from the COVID pandemic. And there are more riders on the subway, especially. Uh, we think ridership is now up into the 60 to 70 percent range uh, compared to uh, pre uh, where it was during the uh, pre-pandemic levels. 
So uh, there's a lot of focus. There are a lot of police on the subway now. There are also a lot of police uh, around the, the mayor because this individual, uh, who we understand had a YouTube channel, also posted a number of things that were uh, complaints about homelessness in the city, complaints generally about the mayor and what he's done in his first months of office as police try to understand what his motive may have been. Uh, but again, from the time this happened at 8.30, uh, 8.24 this morning to now, the investigation has moved very quickly. Um, and that picture of this individual is now going to be everywhere. And it would seem that, um, again, I would not be surprised that in, in the coming hours uh, there's an arrest, there's someone in custody, uh, because everybody in Manhattan, everybody in New York, some 9 million people, are looking for this individual now. Ron, there are a lot of opinions if you talk to New Yorkers today about what all this means, what's going on, how much focus should be put on this and so forth. And we are not going to speculate. Just for those of you watching, we're not going to speculate about what's going on. We're trying very hard to just stick with what we know and what we have confirmed about this. Mayor Adams was also hesitant to attribute a cause to what motivated this shooting. But he has been speaking more broadly about gun violence in New York in general, including in his remarks today. Here is part of what Mayor Adams said earlier. The sea of violence comes from many rivers. We must dam every river that feeds the greater crisis. That is the work of my life, this administration, and this police department. I will not stop until the peace we deserve becomes the reality we experience. You have my word as a former police officer, a fellow New Yorker, and your mayor that we will end this epidemic and that will capture the individual responsible for today's attack. We will capture him and prosecute him to the full extent of the law. So, Ron, this fits more into the mayor's overall violence prevention strategy. Talk about what the response from the city has been just to try to make New Yorkers feel a little safer. I think, I think the mayor is trying to figure out exactly what to do, and what he has been trying to do is increase the amount of police out there on the streets, some special units that were deployed to some neighborhoods, because there, there is a, a, a violence, a gun problem in certain neighborhoods in New York City. There's also a perception of violence and a, a feeling of, of, of fear in a lot of other neighborhoods in, in New York City uh, because of what's been going on. And regardless of what the cause of this was, why this individual did this, it, it was a horrifying attack because it seems to be random. It happened on a subway at 8 o'clock in the morning, heading from here into New York City. Um, and so many people that you talk to uh, could have been on, say they could have been on that subway, were it not here, somewhere else. So again, there, there's a real violence problem here. Again, I'm trying to make a distinction between actual violence, shootings in some neighborhoods, and this perception and fear of violence in others. And as you know, there have been a number of very high-profile incidents on subways. Um, again, some of those targeting Asian-American citizens, a woman who was pushed on the subway tracks some weeks ago. So there, there's this lingering fear about what's going on in the city post-pandemic or as we move to the end of the, and come out of the pandemic. And, and this is going to exacerbate that. This is going to make right. people more concerned about riding the subway, riding public transportation. And the subway is the lifeline of this city. If the subway is not engaged and used, it's impossible to see how New York recovers. So, yes, yeah. we will hear, I'm sure, more in the coming days of what the mayor intends to do and what city officials and the state intend to do. And the response basically seems to be more police. Yeah, and because it's the subway, it's one of those things that tends to wash over to other subway lines. You know, my regular subway was not one of the lines that was affected by this station, but in the larger investigation, there were a number of lines that were delayed or stations that were closed. So everyone who rides the subway definitely has a perspective on what happened today. Thank you, Ron. That's NBC's Ron Allen starting us off tonight from Sunset Park, Brooklyn. Let's continue now with NBC's Jesse Kirsch. He is also in Brooklyn outside NYU Langone Hospital, where a number of the victims have been treated. Jesse, what's the latest on the people who were affected by this shooting and how they're doing right now? Yeah, we know from various hospitals in New York that 29 people were injured in this attack. The number that we have officially from NYPD is 23. 10 people who were shot, another 13 
who suffered from various other injur injuries, whether while they were escaping, getting uh, stumbled upon or something like that, or people who had smoke inhalation. So that gives you a sense of uh, the disparity in the information we're getting from the hospitals versus NYPD, just showing you that the information is still flowing all these hours later. And obviously, police are focused on that manhunt as well. We're told that everyone who was injured is expected to survive, which is great news and frankly somewhat remarkable when you hear about uh, what this alleged gunman, whoever this gunman winds up uh, being when police do name a suspect. Uh, that suspect's uh, arsenal that they had appears to have been able to cause far more damage than actually was done. Again, we know people were shot. We know people suffered from smoke inhalation, had other injuries, and in all, we're told that 29 people were injured, though the majority of them appear to have been discharged from hospitals already. Now, Jesse, the city has activated something called the Unified Victim Identification System. What is that? Yeah, and we will actually want to put something up on the screen. I'm going to read a phone number for you. So this is from the city of New York saying, if you are concerned about someone who may have been affected and you're not able to get through to them, call 311, and that's the number that you can also call from outside of New York. You can call 212-639-9675. So obviously people are going to be concerned about their loved ones if they know that's their train station, that's their neighborhood, that's an area they would have been frequenting. And so this is something that NYPD is putting out there to remind people this is a way you can get in touch with those uh, if you are missing them. But again, at this point, it sounds like everyone who was injured is expected to be okay. So hopefully they've been able to get through to their loved ones. And we know from NYU Langone here in Brooklyn that family members had been visiting their loved ones here earlier today. That is very good news after this terrible attack uh, that everyone seems like they're going to, to pull through this. And I understand that we may be seeing Governor Kathy Hochul visit some of the shooting victims at a different hospital. We're keeping an eye out for that, as well as keeping an eye on additional information from NYPD, although they held a briefing just within the last hour or so. Uh, Jesse, do we know anything more about the kinds of injuries that people suffered in this attack? Gunshot wounds, for sure, yes, but other kinds of injuries that might be involved in all this. Yeah, so the only other specific detail we've been given is smoke inhalation. But one of the other details that has come out throughout the day, the initial report we had from this hospital, for example, were eight people injured brought here, and that number has since gone up to 21. And that is what often happens in these mass casualty events, is that you have the initial rush of people who are brought in by first responders, and then throughout the day, more people show up because they bring themselves here. The official term is self-transporting. And what that often uh, is referring to is people who escaped because they hear the gunshots, they might have seen a shooter, and they're trying to get to safety, get away from the area. They might be bleeding, they might have cut themselves, they might have been shot, and they were just trying to get to safety instead of waiting for an ambulance or first responders. And so you can imagine that there are people who would have been showing up later in the day who might have various kinds of injuries, might have just been hurt trying to get out. They might have tripped and fallen. They might have been pushed over by someone else who was trying to get out to safety as well. So we're not getting the full scope on other injuries beyond the gunshots and the smoke inhalation, which of course is referring to the fact that police say that this suspect released a canister of smoke into a train car uh, as this person began shooting. So there was smoke in the air in a train car, which obviously would have had a closed door during the ride. Thank you, Jesse. That's NBC's Jesse Kirsch continuing now from NYU Langone in Brooklyn. Let's get some analysis on all of this from Mark Claxton. He's the director of public relations and political affairs for the Black Law Enforcement Alliance, and he is also a former NYPD detective. Mr. Claxton, good evening. Good to see you again. Good to be here, Joshua. Can we start with Frank James? I, we'll have viewers watching this from other parts of the world on NBC News now who may not be familiar with that idea because different criminal justice systems work differently. Explain the value of announcing a person of interest. How does that serve the investigation? It doesn't lock the investigators into a particular uh, theory at this point, and it allows the investigation to unfold uh, kind of naturally and normally. It allows you to continue to examine whatever evidence comes in and, and evaluate each piece of evidence independent of another source of evidence. It, it forces you not to jump to any conclusions, which uh, tends to interfere with the integrity of investigation. So. It really is announcing a, a, a person of interest, if you will, as opposed to a suspect, is, is respecting the integrity of the process itself 
and hoping that uh, a lot of the evidence will lead you more and more towards that person of, of interest or perhaps another direction. But you don't want to lock in too early and, 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 and jeopardize the integrity of the investigation and any subsequent prosecution. Talk about what that process looks like from here, especially because we had so much video from people who were there at the station. There were a number of items that were recovered, a gun, a canister with something that appears to be gasoline, fireworks, the key to that U-Haul that was traced back to, some, to the person who rented it. It seems like there's a lot for investigators to go on now, plus whatever credit card transactions this person may make between now and whenever they're intercepted or whatever security cameras they pass. Like, it seems like there's a lot to go on. Yeah, there appears to be a treasure trove of uh, evidence uh, that is being located, identified, found, if you will. You know, normally it doesn't happen. Uh, I'm a investi I was an investigator in the police department for many years, and it is not often that your cases unfold as they do in a lot of these hour-long uh, 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 television shows. But in this particular case, there seems to be a treasure tro trove of evidence enough to 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 formulate a pathway uh, towards apprehending uh, the perpetrators. In addition to what's been uh, spoken about or, or, or revealed by police officials, there's also information that came as a result of, of what's called the domain awareness system in the NYPD, which is a network of, of, of databases and sensors and devices, including cameras, both owned by the NYPD and, and owned privately that the NYPD through their arrangement and agreements have access to. So a lot of the information that's come forward, including uh, vehicle registration information, uh, driver uh, identification information, perhaps some additional uh, camera uh, surveillance footage that has not been publicly acknowledged or released uh, came through this domain awareness system. It's very substantive and significant. Uh, and it is a, a vital part of investigations when you're talking about uh, this level of intelligence gathering. Right, right. I do want to note, by the way, that there is a number that the NYPD has asked people to call if there is information about the whereabouts of Frank James. Again, he is a person of interest. He's not being described as a suspect at the moment. They're asking people to call 800-577-TIPS. That's New York Crime Stoppers, 800-577-TIPS for information about Frank James. You'll find it's a very small type at the bottom of the photo, but I'll read it again. 800-577-TIPS. I, I wonder where you see this in the context of gun violence in New York overall. Governor Kathy Hochul spoke this morning uh, early or in, in the investigation. Her latest budget for the state of New York includes $277 million specifically for gun violence prevention programs, should that get passed by the legislature. Here's part of what the governor said this morning. It has to stop. I'm committing the full resources of our state to fight this surge of crime, this insanity that is seizing our city because we want to get back to normal. Mark Claxton, how do you, what do you make of this surge in crime? I mean, I just, we just got a notice from the city of Sacramento, that deadly shooting where a number of people were killed. They just arrested another suspect, 27-year-old Matula Payton, wanted on multiple felony warrants. They've identified another suspect and they're trying to get more information. What is going on in your view? Is crime going up? Are we just noticing it differently? What are we seeing? As tragic and painful and disturbing as uh, the events uh, today in Brooklyn are, it is just one uh, piece of a larger pattern of increasing violence relating to guns, and not only in New York City, but around the nation. And I think uh, what uh, the elected officials have begun to do is to realize that there needs to be not so much of these localized uh, strategies uh, but more of a national strategy and standard in regards in regards to guns. And absent that, uh, you, you kind of find yourself on a hamster wheel and just repeating these type of response mechanisms and these type of statements and declarations, such as what the governor right, rightly uh, uh, made this morning, these pronouncements about not tolerating it anymore. Uh, it is... Uh, 
we have to deal with both the reality of crime and the perception of crime. And that is a difficult uh, thing to do. And especially when you're locked into a particular uh, response to crime. I think what is right. uh, gives you some hope is that it appears that at least in New York, there is an opportunity to incorporate some other dif disciplines into a crime prevention strategy. There in New York, they're embedding social workers and mental health professionals and increasing employment opportunities as a hope uh, to somehow have a positive impact on this crime trend. But it is uh, unfortunately uh, over the uh, the next several uh, months or so, I really don't see any significant opportunity for, for any uh, significant decreases in crime. And that's across the nation. And briefly, before I have to let you go, what do you see as the potential of improving security and safety on the subway system? Everybody's got a different opinion about New York City subways. Are they safe? Are they getting crazy? Do you feel comfortable riding them? And the answer is probably yes and to a lot of those different things, depending on who you ask. What do you see as the prospect for making the New York City subway system more secure than it is today? Before we go. Well, I, you know, I, I'm a native New Yorker. I'm very familiar with the system and I'm a, a child of uh, riding the subway system in the 70s and 80s. So I think, you know, for me, I look at it as uh, as, as as relative. If you relate the condition of the subway system and the level of crime in the system currently to what was occurring in the early 80s and the 70s, it's day and night. But there is a lot of work that is left to be done. We just have to develop different strategies to attack it. Former NYPD detective Mark Claxton, now with the Black Law Enforcement Alliance. Mr. Claxton, good to have you with us. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Joshua. Still to come, inflation. Are your bills coming in higher than usual? We'll dig into what you could be paying more for and when prices might come back down. Also, severe weather, damaging winds, hail, and even tornadoes continue to affect much of the U.S. The forecast is just ahead. We're glad you're with us for Now Tonight from NBC News. Hey, how's your household budget doing these days? Are you struggling to pay your rent or your mortgage, to fill up the car with gas, to buy groceries? If so, then the latest consumer price index may help explain why, though granted it is cold comfort. But the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics released the latest report today. Inflation has soared 8.5% since last year. That is a 41-year high. Now, overall wages have risen, too, by 5.6%, but pay is not generally keeping up with the cost of living. I mean, prices for many things are up these days. Meat, poultry, fish, eggs, even hotels and airfares and used cars. And as for gas prices, they've dropped 23 cents in the last month, but compared to last year, they are up nearly 49%. Today in Iowa, President Biden announced a new plan to help control gas prices. But the Environmental Protection Agency is planning to issue an emergency waiver to allow E15 gasoline that uses more ethanol from homegrown crops to be sold across the United States this summer in order to increase fuel supply. Now, this matters because E15 gasoline is about 10 cents a gallon cheaper than the conventional gasoline, what's sometimes called E10 gasoline. But they usually don't sell E15 in the summer because of air quality concerns. This waiver lets Americans buy this slightly cheaper gas for a longer period of time. Joining us now is CNBC contributor Ron Insana. He is also senior advisor to Schroeder's North America. Ron, let's stick with gasoline for a moment. The Biden administration also recently said that a gas tax holiday is a possibility. Here's part of what Press Secretary Jen Psaki has said about this. Watch. It is certainly on the table um, and certainly something we continue to consider. Um, we have seen a number of states do that. And while, um, you know, it can have an impact, about 18 cents, I believe, if I remember correctly, uh, one of the reasons why we're considering it. So, Ron, talk about gas prices and how that factors into all this, including whether or not a federal gas tax holiday would, would make much of a difference. 
Probably, at least in the past, Joshua, it hasn't. Um, and then not all of that savings uh, from a gas tax necessarily gets passed on to consumers. What we're dealing with, you know, in, in reality is, is a supply shock, not just in energy, but in a wide variety of, of, of manufactured goods and, and commodities across the board. Uh, part of it's pandemic related. Part of it has to do with the war in Ukraine. And so, yeah, gas prices, because oil still sits at about $100 a barrel, are elevated relative to last year. They have, as you said, come down a bit. We peaked at about $130 a barrel uh, in terms of oil prices. And so that's put, taking a little bit of pressure off now that we've dropped 30 bucks a barrel. Uh, but as long as the war rages with Ukraine, as long as the U.S. and the EU are contemplating putting a ban on Russian energy exports, the largest exporter of oil in the world, it's going to be hard for oil prices and by extension gasoline prices to come down meaningfully, especially as we move now into the summer driving season and the summer travel season overall. Can we just be clear about why gas costs what it costs right now? I mean, is gas actually harder to acquire, refine, distribute, and sell today? Or are gas companies and gas station chains just getting greedy? Like, why are costs I, going up right now? <laughs> yeah, that is always, you know, a convenient um, conversation for some to have that it's just price gouging. But, you know, if you go back to 2020, when the price of crude oil uh, futures fell to minus $37, and when we we're in the midst of the pandemic and people were not driving or flying, oil prices crashed. And so oil companies took enormous hits. Now we've had just the reverse happen because demand has come back faster than supply. Um, it, it's hard you know, to navigate this. If there were a true conspiracy or price fixing effort underway, you would think that oil companies would be much better at stabilizing the price and eliminating some of this volatility. So we're having a real world problem here, which is higher transportation costs, higher trucking costs, higher costs to get oil from Canada, from Mexico, which is where we principally get our imports from. We produce 11.8 million barrels a day out of the 19 million that we consume. So this, and the price of oil is set on the global market. So when supplies are constrained, the dollar price of oil goes up and by extension then gasoline prices go with it. Let me ask you about groceries. Sarah was one of the people who told us that she is coping with grocery prices a little differently these days. Sarah tweeted, we started frequenting the low cost grocery store first, then going to Target and finally the regular grocery store for food. I feel like this is such a big general topic to talk about because yeah. groceries means orange juice and it means you know salmon fillets and it means cheerios and it means toilet paper it means a lot of things a lot of different people absolutely with that said are there certain common bonds or threads that we can draw in terms of why groceries yeah. are generally going up or do we really have to kind of take it piece by piece it's, it's actually a little of both. I mean, we, we've had a, a broad upward drift in commodity prices. And once again, this is related to some of the pandemic disruptions. And in the case of foodstuffs, when you look at Russia and Ukraine, they provide 30% of the world's grains. Here, a startling number that I saw over the weekend, Ukraine last year shipped 43 million tons of grain to the rest of the world. From July of last year to February, it fell to 1 million tons. They're expected to ship 65 million tons this year, and they're not going to come anywhere close. So corn and wheat and soybeans have gone up exponentially. We've seen the price of lumber go up and down, which affects housing costs. The Fed's raising interest rates, so we're seeing mortgage rates go up. Um, we're in the midst of a, again, pandemic and war-induced inflation that's very different from other experiences that we've had in the past insofar as it's come on so fast. In, 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 the pay, in the space of about a year or two, we've seen a surge like this, which is really more like what we've seen in post-war periods than what we saw, let's say, in the 70s and 80s. So yeah, broadly speaking, a basket of groceries has gone up in price. And again, not just the commodities, the cost of transportation, the cost of shipping overseas, all of those things until recently went up very, very dramatically. They've only started to come down now. Before I got to let you go, I appreciate you noting that there are lots of different reasons why certain prices have gone up. Lumber, you're right. I remember them talking about how the price keeps going up and down and how that affects new home construction and new home prices. Bank of America just put out this warning that a recession shock 
lies ahead. I wonder how everyday consumers should read that, especially because some of the factors we've heard about lately have to do with the war in Ukraine. Some of yep. the factors have to do with just the changing nature of supply chains. Some of it has to do with COVID. Some of it has to do with climate change. Some of it has to do with the changing ways in which we shop and do business, of shopping more online than in brick and mortar stores. How do we take all these factors? Is this something that's just kind of like <laughs> inevitable? Is this a Ukraine well, thing? Like, what does no, that I mean? mean? None of this was inevitable. I mean, again, if you dial, you know, well, let's put it in our terms, if you roll the videotape back to, to March of, or even February of 2020, right, we had the unemployment rate at 3.5% and inflation was still below 2%. Then we have a global pandemic. Then we have a war. And the Federal Reserve and other central banks around the world decide that their biggest mission right now is to fight this surge in prices, what we more commonly call inflation. So the Federal Reserve now is poised to raise rates more aggressively than we thought even just a few months ago. They're likely in the first week of May to raise rates by half a point after having just raised a quarter. They may do another half point. They'll then take other steps to tighten credit. We've seen mortgage rates double in nine months, which could put a big dent in the housing market, which is on fire. So yeah, a 28 percent chance of recession, as Bank of America describes it, is, does not mean that it's inevitable. A lot of folks in our business worry that the Fed's going to raise rates too much and tip the economy into recession later this year or early next year. The Fed believes the economy is strong enough to withstand the rate hikes, slow demand a little bit, and bring prices down into what we call a soft landing. There have only been three of those since about the 1950s or 60s. We'll see if the Fed can pull that off with higher rates, a little softer demand, and time for these supply chains to normalize so that we get more goods on shelves in a much more expeditious fashion than we've seen over the course of the last two years. CNBC's Ron Insana, I have thrown a lot of very unfair questions at you tonight in terms of <laughs> what does it all mean? But I, I, appreci <laughs> I appreciate that you're game for them. I really appreciate your game for them, especially because there are so many factors and, and it helps to talk them through. Ron, thanks very it's much. Complex. We appreciate it. It's not a typical business cycle type environment that we're For in sure. right now. Yeah. It is not at all, but super helpful. We appreciate it, Ron. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. An update from Ukraine is next. Today, President Biden called Vladimir Putin a dictator and accused him of genocide. What kinds of charges might we expect, if any, from the International Criminal Court? That's especially in light of horrific accounts of torture and rape in Ukraine. You'll hear one woman's story just ahead. Stay close. All right, now to the war in Ukraine. Today, President Biden called what is happening there a genocide for the first time. We'll get back to that in just a minute. But we're also focused on an unconfirmed report that Russia might have used chemical weapons. That report came after a small group of people got sick in Mariupol. The U.S. and other Western officials are investigating that claim. And again, it is as yet unverified. The accusation comes from Ukraine's Azov Battalion. That is a group of ultra-nationalist fighters that are helping defend the city. That group claims that Russian forces used a poisonous substance of unknown origin. That's how they put it. Today, Secretary of State Antony Blinken said the U.S. could not confirm whether Russia did this, but he said that the U.S. had credible information that Russia might do it. We're not in a position to confirm anything. I don't think the uh, Ukrainians are either. Um, but let me say this. We uh, had credible information that Russian forces may use a variety of riot control agents, uh, including tear gas, mixed with chemical agents that would cause uh, stronger symptoms uh, to weaken and incapacitate entrenched uh, Ukrainian fighters and civilians. It's a concern that we had from before the aggression started worth noting again nbc news cannot independently verify that assertion from the secretary of state meanwhile the pentagon says russian forces appear to be preparing a new military offensive in eastern ukraine that's particularly in the donbas region pro-russia separatists have been fighting there since 2014 Today, Russia's President Vladimir Putin effectively admitted as much for the first time. He promised that Russia's operation will, quote, continue until its full completion, unquote. This is week seven of this war. 
more people are making some stunning accusations against Russian forces, including sexual assault. This next report might be pretty disturbing to watch, but it contains one woman's harrowing account. She told her story to NBC's Molly Hunter. 28-year-old Olena and her husband Sasha were living in Hostomel when the war started. In early March, while she was out looking for water, Olena was captured by Russian troops, she says, held hostage in a one-room apartment for two days. But it was about to get even worse. Starting the moment she was hit by a piece of burning metal shrapnel, that's Olena's day one. I thought that I was going to can you describe the wound? She was in so much pain that on day two, by Olena's timeline, she went looking for first aid. Russian soldiers occupying her town said they could help. Olena is thin, with a slight build. We're not showing her full face. She and her husband were very poor even before the war broke out. They have a seven-year-old daughter, they tell me. She's with relatives. On Olena's day three, Russian soldiers offering medical aid again changed her bandages, she says. So now we're at day four. What happens day four? She tells us three different soldiers came to their house dressed in civilian clothes, saying they were there to help. She has no idea how they knew she was wounded. One of them, a Russian speaker, said he could take a look at her wound, she says, taking her upstairs. So she went back downstairs. Medics tell us her husband had at least one broken rib. And the following morning on day five, the soldier who had been upstairs with Olena returned. Ну, со мной все нормально, говорю. Не надо, говорю, мене дивитися, говорю. Говорю, глянь мужа, говорю. Він даже не став його дивитися. Ну, за руку, короче, посадив мене в машину, повіз мене в той дом, там, де нас держали в племені. Ну, короче, ну, і знасилував мене. А нікому просто було, ну, кричати, там взагалі нема нікого. So he took you to a place where he knew no one was going to be able to hear you. Я плакала, ну, що я була просто ранена, про що думала. She made a run for it, arriving home in tears. What did it feel like for it to come home and your wife to tell you that? So they left, arriving here in this area of Bucha, which is where we meet her, we believe about two weeks after the rape. Are you angry? Have you even had time to process? Molly Hunter, NBC News, Kyiv. Leaders from around the world have declared what is happening in Ukraine as war crimes. But it's up to the International Criminal Court to investigate and ultimately prosecute. You'll meet a special advisor to that court when we come back. This week's severe weather across the U.S. threatens more than 100 million people. It is the fourth week in a row with these kinds of storms. Last night, a half dozen tornadoes hit parts of Arkansas. Charleston, Arkansas, that's near the Oklahoma state line, saw damaged homes, buildings, fallen trees, and hail the size of tennis balls. A tornado was also reported near the Little Rock Air Force Base, but base officials say there was no major damage. Forecasters expect these storms to continue tonight and tomorrow, and the area of concern is a 1,000 miles long, from southern Minnesota all the way to the Gulf Coast. NBC meteorologist Michelle Grossman joins us now. Michelle, what are we looking for this week?
Hi there, Joshua. We're looking at severe weather once again. Fourth week straight, as you mentioned, second day this week. Tonight, we're looking at severe weather, and then also again tomorrow. We're going to quiet down on Thursday, finally. So let's show you what's happening now because radar is very active. We are looking at dangerous weather tonight into the overnight hours, into the early parts of Wednesday, and then we're going to do it all over again once that atmosphere resets. So this is what it looks like on radar. You can see lots of lightning, some heavy downpours. That's where you see the darker colors, the yellows, the reds, the oranges, and then and on the back side, you see blue. We are looking at a historic snowstorm, April snowstorm in the northern plains of the northern Rockies, where some could see 36 inches of snow. So as we go in a little deeper here, we're looking at a tornado watch. That is in the pink uh, in the northern part of the nation, also the southern part of the nation, also a severe thunderstorm watch. And we're seeing warnings pop in and out. I didn't even show them to you because we're seeing them come and go. And that's what we're going to be watching all night long. 45 million at risk, once again, stretching from the Great Lakes all the way down to the upper Midwest, all the way down to the southern tier of our nation. Where you see the red, that's a moderate risk. That's four out of five on the severe scale. The orange is your enhanced risk. That includes Kansas City, Waterloo, also Dallas and Austin. So this is what we're expecting once again. Hail larger than two inches. Last night we saw hail over four inches, as big as a softball. And that causes a lot of damage. So we could see damage possible across Iowa and eastern Nebraska. Of course, we're watching the threat for tornadoes, where we could see some strong tornadoes too over EF2 plus that's going to be the same story on Wednesday and then look what happens on Wednesday. It sort of expands, but really over the same places too. So now we're into the mid Mississippi Valley, into the Ohio Valley. 56 million people will be impacted tomorrow. We could see a severe weather threat outbreak as we head towards tomorrow. And it's going to be the same threats over and over again. 75 mile per hour winds or greater. That could cause a lot of damage from St. Louis to Nashville, Little Rock into Jackson. Also watching the chance for strong tornadoes over a large area from the Great Lakes down to parts of Louisiana. Greenville, you're in that Memphis, Poplar Bluff, Nashville also. And we're watching the chance for hail once again. We're seeing hail possibly over two inches on Wednesday. So the rainfall forecast, we're worried about flooding as well, flash flooding. We've had four weeks straight of storms pretty much in the same areas. The grounds are saturated. We're added rainfall to that. We're going to see one to two inches of rain, maybe even higher that we could see up to three inches. So a flood threat is also likely for Paducah, Hopkinsville, and Dyersburg. And Joshua, I didn't get to this yet, but we are looking at a historic blizzard. It's blizzard conditions right now in uh, Bismarck where we could see winds gusting over 60 miles per hour and three feet of snow. Nonstop with the severe weather this yeah. year and lots and lots of people that have to keep an eye on it pretty much all spring yeah. long. NBC meteorologist right. Michelle Grossman. Michelle, thanks very much. Thanks. Up next, we will take a closer look at what a war crime actually is and whether anyone will face charges for crimes in Ukraine. You'll meet a special advisor to the International Criminal Court before we go. Today, President Biden called Vladimir Putin a dictator. He also accused Putin of committing genocide in Ukraine. None of it should hinge on whether a dictator declares war and commits genocide in a half a world away. Now, this was the first time Mr. Biden used that word, genocide to describe Russia's actions in Ukraine. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has been saying it for weeks, but the White House has argued that using the G word requires a lengthy State Department review. So, are Russian forces committing war crimes or genocide? The International Criminal Court is investigating. The United Nations is also gathering evidence of possible war crimes, and Russia continues to deny responsibility for any such crimes. Let's bring in Leila Sadat. She's a professor of international criminal law at Washington University in St. Louis. Professor Sadat, welcome to the program. Thank you, Joshua. It's great to be here. So what is genocide in international legal terms? I rely on Merriam-Webster for general definitions, and there it's defined as the deliberate and systematic destruction of a racial, political, or cultural group. Is there some kind of equivalent actual legal definition that the ICC could act upon? How does that work? Joshua, uh, it's a great question, actually. After World War II, when we had experienced the Holocaust, states adopted an international treaty called the Genocide Convention. And in that treaty, which dates back to 1948, they said that the destruction in whole or in part 
of a racial, religious, ethnic, or national group constitutes the crime of genocide if the individual who does it has the specific intent to do so. It's a very difficult crime to prove, and it's a very important international treaty. What does it take to prove this crime? I mean, what would investigators be looking for? Well, what they're going to be looking for is, a, is, is more than the, the, we've seen the horror on the ground. And so we've seen the attacks on the hospitals. We've seen cleansing of villages. We've seen individuals uh, raped. Now there are allegations of sexual violence, torture, murder, deportation, displacement. We've seen a lot of different crimes. What we have to do to show that it's a genocide is show that these crimes were actually committed with the intent to destroy the group, literally to physically destroy the group. And so normally with crimes like this, we don't immediately call it a genocide. We typically call it crimes against humanity because crimes against humanity are exactly these kind of widespread and systematic crimes committed against civilians pursuant to a policy of doing so. And with crimes against humanity, we don't have to prove the specific intent we just have to show the criminal pattern. What impact would this kind of a prosecution have? I mean, there was a piece in the New York Times that was written on Monday that was rather pessimistic about the odds for war crimes prosecutions, and it referred to any charges as, and I'm quoting from the article, likely little more than symbolic. If those in power act as if they are immune to the laws of war, it is because in practice they often are, unquote. So the ICC, so prosecutors at the UN say, Vladimir Putin, you are guilty of war, you are, uh, you are charged with war crimes, you are charged with genocide. And Vladimir Putin says, come get me, you and what army? Mm -hmm. That's kind of the end of it, isn't there? I mean, isn't it? I mean, there's nowhere else to go from there. So, Joshua, when we have a big mass atrocity like this, um, what we do is we don't necessarily focus at, at the International Criminal Court. We may not focus all our energy immediately on the highest level perpetrators. So what we've seen is that the Russians are actually using open radio communications to correspond and communicate with each other. Germany, Ukraine, the United States, France have all been sending investigators in addition to the investigators coming from the International Criminal Court. And so what we're starting to do is essentially map the conflict, map where the atrocities are taking place. We have evidence, we have photos, we have communications, we have intercepts, we have aerial photography in particular, and we have eyewitness te testimony that can tell us all about the pattern of criminality. Those prosecutions can take place of, of lower or mid-level perpetrators. They can take place either in Ukraine, at the ICC, or even in Europe under universal jurisdiction. At the ICC, what we're going to be looking at is the pattern or practice and what we call the linkage evidence, which links the crimes on the ground to the masterminds behind the scenes. That takes more time. But the ICC has time. Ukraine doesn't have time. That's a different issue. The ICC is a permanent court. It's not a special ad hoc tribunal. And we will wait as long as it takes until we can have our accused in the dock. We've seen this in the former Yugoslavia. It took a long time to get Karadzic, to get Mladic, to indict Milosevic. We've seen it in the Sudan. But we have time. We're playing the long game here. They're playing the short game of force, and we're playing the long game of law. In our last few seconds, I just want to underscore something you said. It sounds like the possibility for the ICC, at least in the short term, is the people who have actually committed these crimes, alleged crimes, on the ground, rather than just focusing on Vladimir Putin at the top. Did I hear you right on that, briefly? That's exactly right. We have to build these cases from the bottom up, not just focus on the top down. And remember, a lot of the indictments are going to be under seal. People are not even going to know that they've been indicted. And that's to make the possibility of arrest more feasible. Professor Leila Sadat of Washington University in St. Louis, I appreciate you making time for us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure. And hey, thank you for making time for us also. Remember, we're still taking your questions and stories ahead of tax day. The deadline for us to file our federal income taxes is Monday, April 18th. 
The Washington Post's Michelle Singletary will answer our questions this Thursday. So send them to us. We are at NBC Now Tonight on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. Leave us a voicemail, 888-575-2NBC. That's 888-575-2622. Or email us, nowtonight at NBCNews.com. We look forward to getting your questions and stories, but until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. We'll keep you posted on the investigation in that shooting in Brooklyn here on NBC News Now, and I will see you tomorrow. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.